introduce our first design team, Team Bionic. Good morning. Thank you. Um, I'm Marcel Wilson, Design Director at Bionic. It's an honor to be here, and I speak for our whole team when I say that. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge our collaborators, Penn Design, WXY, Studio for Urban Projects, in addition to the rest of our team. Presenting today is uh, Bionic Project Manager, the fearless Sarah Moose Thompson, Clara Weiss, and Karen McCloskey from Penn Design. Our team was organized. around the cause of finding the area that needs help first in the face of sea level rise. Through our research and analysis, we are selected to study San Rafael. San Rafael is a small city that exhibits all the stresses of the Bay Area uh, and the metropolis because it's one of the vital infrastructural, logistical, and workforce centers around the Bay. Everything flows through this place. It's the industrial part of the city that was shaped by the logic of engineering optimization geared towards the short-term economic outcomes. The long-term needs of people, ecology, equity, and the pleasure were never considered. Today, this area is threatened by flooding. But it's also threatened by the old paradigm of monofunctional infrastructure. The easiest solution would be to continue in this vein, to gate off the creek, raise the levees, and proceed with life as it's known today. But to continue with this paradigm would compound risk. It would further separate the city from its waterfront. It would eradicate coastal habitats and ultimately become obsolete, leaving fewer options for future generations. In the old paradigm, it's disaster that defines us. It is reactive and not proactive. And for San Rafael, the big question is clear. For the cost, effort, and ecological impact of the old paradigm, the conventional solution, is it really worth it, and for whom? Or can San Rafael initiate a process for strategic change? Finding a new paradigm is the challenge for San Rafael, and we think the paradigm is life with the Bay. Elevate San Rafael is the name of our project and the simplest way to describe what needs to be done, to occupy higher elevations and raise the quality of life and social connection for everyone. We're not proposing that the city should merely adapt, retreat, or resist. We're proposing that the city should evolve with intention. Elevating is to physically elevate habitation and the bonds of community and dignity, to elevate social and economic opportunities using policy for urban change, to lift infrastructure and provide multifunctional benefits for recreation and ecology to persist and thrive. But it must be done by design and not by disaster. It must be done for the benefit of all and not the few. It must begin now and not later. And it will require changing our policy and financing mechanisms to make it possible and equitable. I'm gonna hand it to Sarah to talk about our experience with the city of San Rafael. Our approach engaged the forces and cultures that created post-industrial cities to forecast how we might employ them to rectify solutions, to find cumulative effects, to enable a higher level of equity and sophistication, and to ask the community how they want to live. Today, East San Rafael is home to thousands of people and businesses. The infrastructure, roads, housing stock, and natural environment are all showing signs of urban stress and environmental change. The city is defined and divided by the major transportation infrastructure running through its core, Highway 101 and 580. A large portion of the area is light industrial and auto retailers. Downtown is located along the creek, and there are existing neighborhoods and community facilities all in low-lying areas. San Rafael Creek flows directly adjacent to the Canal District neighborhood. A portion of the community lives and works on the water. The data behind the canal community describes a population that is hardworking, industrious, and resourceful. It also describes an immigrant community in need of more resources, better housing, better employment opportunities, and the means to remain in San Rafael. The engineering paradigm of the last century used plans and formulas to forge solutions. 
these methods are detached from the nuance, complexity, and specificity of life that is essential. A new paradigm requires new methods, tools, techniques. At every stage, we asked, how can we design and use methods to find a better way? To communicate with stakeholders, we designed tools like logos, books, posters, stickers, models and educational toys, and surveys. We heard the inspiring ideas of San Rafael's youth and realized that this is the generation that will have to adapt and live with water. To engage and educate people who have different backgrounds and abilities, we designed a 3D printed flood toy to explain how floods work in San Rafael. And to increase the visibility of the issues, we designed a van called the Floodmobile. Hashtag Flomo. And we donated it to the community as an educational tool and a lasting resource. We designed pilot projects, visions of new city forms, and long-term strategies to benefit future generations and the region. Tours and curated events offered opportunities to discuss ideas with experts, to speed up time, to get more people's attention and move faster, and to provoke deeper questions and answers, and ultimately to transcend education, language, and age barriers to engage people. The agency of design in all of these forms allowed us to elevate the dialogue and the process towards a vision for the future. Through our conversations, it became clear that there are many stakeholders with overlapping yet distinct priorities. To elevate life and put housing first, there are a range of mechanisms at different levels of government. These will all have to incorporate acquisition, adaptation, and enhancements, and a range of financing and regulatory tools to subsidize and incentivize housing and promote community ownership. The question is, how do we employ these mechanisms through design to create resilience now? Over to Claire. I hope you can all see how many occupations and ways of life there are in San Rafael. The design of our engagement strategy used and joined community partners and our own team's own resources to create a net of outreach. Through this approach, we created a broad reach to the community at large and to groups with special interests to learn about the process and participate. In a very short amount of time, we wanted to understand the details of life in San Rafael and honestly, the everyday issues that matter for people, their families and businesses now. We also wanted to reach a deeper understanding and a deeper level of conversation with the people that live there about the threat of flooding and about sea level rise. From these interactions, common themes emerge to inform short and long-term design thinking. It was clear People share the desire for essentials that allow them to thrive. Safety, health, secure housing, a livelihood, equal access to resources, a community to rely on. We gained an appreciation, and I hope you all will, for the community members themselves and their social cohesion. It's robust, complex, and interwoven, and therefore highly resilient. So what physical structures and relationships can continue to grow this social cohesion? Pickleby Park, which you're seeing there, is the community's most important resilience infrastructure. In the near term, we propose a catalyst project that would protect San Rafael now and enhance the community's resilience. This first project is Protect Pickleweed Park, and it twins fl uh, upgrading flood infrastructure and the pump station with a multi-benefit project providing upgraded amenities to the community. So in combining civic activities with regular daily activities, you have improved and accessible sports fields and playgrounds and water access to recreation. It would also make a new platform for events, for education of all types, group activities, include community rooms, education, work and play spaces, and offer shade, rain cover, and lighting at night. 
But in a time of crisis, for today, it provides a safe haven for the entire community and would be robust enough to withstand flooding. Elevating this community space represents, in a way, a sample of the catalytic projects you'll see. This multi-benefit approach to infrastructure is a critical in initial project for San Rafael. So what's at risk? I'll hand it off to Karen. San Rafael has assets and risks at all scales from the size of an individual property to the Bay Area metropolis. Our process quantified and measured these risks to help educate our stakeholders as well as inform our design process. We cannot have gotten as far as we did with, uh, in terms of understanding the social and ecological conditions on the ground without, without all of the work already done by the city, the county, and various agencies. So we built on this body of research and did our own economic and topographic analysis. The tax base of the city is at risk given the many business taxpayers are located in the 100-year and 500-year floodplain. These risks are in the billions of dollars, um, and this is without sea level rise. Many of these vulnerabilities are because a large portion of San Rafael was built on a former mudflat, as you can see from this early real estate speculation. And these problems will only be made worse by the fact that the land is still subsiding. Furthermore, all rain eventually flows to and under the canal district, which is the lowest lying area of the city, and thus will be most severely impacted by storms and sea level rise. A careful look at the topography shows that everything in Cyan is already below sea level. In 20 years, the green areas could be below sea level, and a 500-year storm event, which could happen at any time, would flood to the purple line that you see, which is also possible projected sea level rise by century's end. The area typically stays dry now because it's pumped. Um, however, there are many corroded and undersized pipes. So this system is a major vulnerability. Any human or technical failure could devastate the residents and local economy at any time. If pumps failed now, you'd have this much water sitting on land, zero to two feet, depending where you are in the canal district. With near-term sea level rise, you could get significant damage even without a major rain event. And then, of course, if we get, as we get further out in time, there's greater potential uh, human suffering and loss of life. In terms of economic losses, one pump failure district um, have huge losses. A total power outage could have potential losses in the billions of dollars for residents and businesses. We also looked at construction type. Um, the wood frame housing stock in the canal district is at risk of condemnation um, if there were a flood event and human life is at risk due to the number of ground floor units occupied, as well as lack of emergency preparedness and few escape routes. So this is a largely immigrant population of renters who are economically vulnerable and therefore less able to recover from floods or earthquakes and with fewer means to move out of harm's way. Um, this is concerning, especially given that a flood event like this could occur um, in the next 30 years. And so it's clear to us that San Rafael is at risk now. Uh, the combination of climate events, subsidence, and rising tides will only create more severe and frequent flooding in the future. And so a choice must be made now. One path would lead to multiplying risk. The other path would lead to evolving the city's relationship to water. And Marcel will tell us about the strategy to evolve and elevate. Our research led us to two main conclusions. By time, the city needs an immediate solution to reduce risk and make large scale change for the long term. Think big, be strategic with its limited resources to build large scale resilience. There are multiple contradictions between the data and community sentiments. For us, both are true, both are right. And it's this realization that led us to the imperative that everything and everyone needs to elevate. And how is the question? Our proposal addresses the near term directly and uses a series of catalytic projects to set the ground for long term strategy. The proposal also frames the, the uh, accompanying policy and finance mechanisms needed to stimulate and guide change in an equitable way. These projects are designed to be interrelated and mutual, and they would evolve into a larger order for city scale resilience. Catalyst Project One by Time. 
Project One buys time by completing the Bay Trail. The trail currently runs through uh, and along San Rafael's shoreline, but it doesn't connect the, sh uh, the shoreline to the neighborhoods, the downtown, or the creek. And below, uh, this is uh, existing Canal Street. And below grade, there are existing corrugated pipes. They're rusting, they need investment. And a new bike lane on Canal Street would complete the Bay Trail. Uh, it improved mobility. Uh, it would create a multi-use path that doubles for risk reduction and the majority of at-risk housing and businesses. Equally important, the new facility would, uh, would future-proof utilities and services. So this solution uses continuous city-owned rights of way to limit risk. It offers options for buying more time by raising it in the future or letting water in. And it activates new priorities and requirements for upgrading buildings. Similar to a seismic upgrade program in San Rafael, this approach requires safety upgrades for flooding and offers owners uh, of individual parcels choices for how they could comply. On multiple parcels along the creek, there are larger opportunities to join properties through development, parking, and public access requirements to create a more resilient edge. Project two, new forms of living. To add new stock, for businesses and housing in transition, a new supply would be created on a large underutilized site to, uh, that's adjacent to the existing community. The project would connect two areas of existing high ground with parking and light industrial podium. Many canal residents' uh, livelihoods rely on a vehicle. This new supply of floodproof parking would solve a basic need and reinforce their financial security. It would also be an expansion of the existing community creating a new school on higher ground and greater diversity of social spaces connected to the bay. The efficiency of this multi-benefit configuration would sponsor the restoration of a large salt marsh. Designed for dynamics and change, the marsh would include culture and gender stewardship, choreograph recreation, and adapt over time. And coupled with, construction, uh, with a constructed reef catalyst project to the east, the marsh's biodiversity and sediment supply would be multiplied and more capable of absorbing extreme events and king tides that are promised by the future. Project three, the canal. The pattern of ownership, infrastructure, and maritime uses along the canal is the source of its charm, but also its greatest weakness. To prime its potential as a waterfront destination, a program of floating wetlands would be installed along underutilized portions of the creek, beginning uh, with an unnavigable section in the, in the background of that image. The wetlands would be employed to test their viability, create habitat, reduce erosion from boat wakes. But they would also build stewardship. They'd stimulate activity. They'd draw attention to the canal as a destination. At the beginning of this challenge, we envisioned the full transformation of the canal, and we still believe this direction is essential for resilience, but larger scale change is needed to make this possible. Project four, the reef. The ecology of the edge in San Rafael is a series of disconnected projects and ecological resources. In the center of the shoreline, there's an existing pilot project testing constructed oyster reefs and how they react to coastal processes. A more resilient and diverse edge would be interconnected, related, culturally valued more broadly, and equipped to adapt to environmental change and less sediment supply. To prepare, we're proposing an array of constructed reefs to support the main marsh areas the array would build upon the existing pilot. And it would test the viability of these structures through sedimentation, habitat creation, and wave energy dissipation. We specifically studied sedimentation transport and the near uh, shore conditions through hydrodynamic modeling. And it suggested patterns for sedimentation deposition and the scale, of ne and the scale necessary to influence coastal processes. The initial pilots would test different locations, forms, orientations, and exposures to San Rafael Bay. And they would also test the capacity for habitat creation, including eelgrass beds and a greater range of bathymetric conditions. These pilots uh, should be initiated early with the inland marsh restoration. They take time to establish, and their ecological benefits are of value now. We also see the relationship and value of this technology to build tourism, awareness, and stewardship, in addition uh, to the reef that we're, pro we're proposing a floating island to serve as a support station for research and monitoring, a safe way to teach and observe, and to create an unparalleled destination and experience on the Bay Water Trail. 
And as these projects build over time with increased boating facilities and attractions along the waterfront, San Rafael would be an, a known waterfront destination that exhibits resilience through its form, ecological diversity, recreational value, and cultural investment. And so learning from these pilots, the reef sites would be multiplied in time to form an enormous array. And this would become a nursery for diversity of marine species, a wave attenuator, a sediment surging device for marshes, and a gradient of integrated ecological niches. And the reef is a pilot for an even larger scale ecological initiative. San Rafael is a missing gap in the coastal ecologies of the county. Uh, and, and the reef is a pilot uh, that goes from the size of uh, just the, the small existing pilot to the size of a city to the size of a county and the, ecological, and the ecology of the entire shoreline. The long term. San Rafael appears to be intractably stuck with no room to move. But the business tax base of San Rafael in the 100-year floodplain is largely comprised of uses that are undergoing industrial transformation. So uh, we're seeing that, uh, that uh, since the time the project started, the Toys R Us closed. Retail is changing, going to smaller formats. Mobility is changing, and it's going to decreases in ownership and sales models. Technology is changing, and it's setting patterns for new logistical modes. Insurance is changing, and the values of properties are shifting dramatically. So we see this as a tremendous opportunity to engage. We've devised a strategy that engages these forces to enhance mobility, to reinvent infrastructure, enable ecology, and provide enduring protection. The city will need to use incentives to shift the pattern of urbanization from diffuse and autocentric to a more equitable and resilient form, using enhanced zoning, density bonuses, housing subsidies, and community land trusts. Property owners will be motivated to face the creek, add housing and business space, provide continuous water access, and nature-based solutions to define the edge. The canal district, uh, in, in areas currently projected, uh, protected by levees, property owners will be incentivized to build flood-proof housing and to add supply where allowable. Businesses will be incentivized to become flood-proof as well, or to move their operations in San Rafael to the area west of the freeway where conventional risk reduction is in place and reliably stout. And the 101 and 580 freeway that run through San Rafael, this is critical regional infrastructure, and it needs to be protected. Kerner Boulevard, that connects the high ground from the south to Pickleweed Park, and Francisco, uh, parallels the transportation corridor and leads to the downtown area. These should be the future spine of development, services, infrastructure, and movement. Along these city-owned streets, acquired properties could be raised to higher elevations and connect to higher ground. Infrastructure in these alignments would be buffered from destructive forces of water and seismicity by new edges that host ecology, culture, and maritime activities. Infrastructure would also influence the pattern of development away from the most hazard prone areas uh, uh, and, and the subsidized uh, portions of the, of the district. Pickleweed Park would remain connected uh, to the community for maintaining its social resilience. So in a residential condition where ownership is compact, some properties will raise, some will change ownership. There will be opportunities to build greener infrastructure with acquisition. And over time, they would reorient their position to the environment and the infrastructure that would support them. In an industrial condition, uh, the, 101, uh, the 101 and 580 transportation corridor is highly exposed to flooding. And along this edge, the parcels are larger in scale. Uh, there's a clear opportunity for the city and the regional transportation agencies to anticipate the future and combine their resources here. So again, Owners may choose to protect in place, others may sell, and parcels may be acquired for the creation of green infrastructure. And in time, this strategy leads to a higher datum embedded with stout infrastructure, living and working that is more resilient. So this strategy for elevating offers future generations options. It offers space and resources for how they continue to build resilience in the long term and could choose to persist in this place for another 100 years or more. But fundamental to this possibility is the cultural value and human dimension 
that this infrastructure needs to carry in addition to its utility. To offer mobility, enable income, opportunity, and connection. To be embedded with trails, pools, fields, and connection to the water for recreation and health. To offer social spaces for community, enjoyment, and prospect. These are the aspirations of an elevated local community and an infrastructure that will serve the region for the long term. So like any other regional infrastructure, it will take generations to plan, fund, and build resilience for this nexus of the region. The Elevate framework for San Rafael coordinates this distant possibility with the near-term needs and incremental investments so that results of elevating life locally will compound value exponentially as it functions as large-scale infrastructure for the Bay Area metropolis. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to take a moment now to welcome our jury officially for being here. Uh, thanks so much for coming uh, from all around the world to be with us today. And we'll now open the uh, jury question portion of the conversation. And for those of you who are in the audience or online, uh, the team wants to hear from you as well. You can submit comments uh, online at resilientbayarea.org slash comments. Um, they're very interested in those as well. Now we'll just go to the jury if you guys want to just jump in. Uh, sure. I'm going to ask Ann Griffith uh, from Enterprise uh, to come up to the stage. She's our, our housing expert and guru. Uh, hi, uh, Cynthia Smith, Cooper Hewitt, Smithsonian Design Museum uh, in New York. Uh, thank you so much for what you've presented. I've watched all of the presentations. Um, I really uh, like this idea of uh, elevation um, and how you took it through uh, the beginnings with the education, uh, the catalytic uh, pilots, all the way to the end where you're talking about uh, in the long term uh, that there's a real opportunity to uh, engage the region with, with all of this. Um, my question is, um, it wasn't clear to me how you um, start the catalytic projects. There were four of them, and it seemed really, while it, amazing, they seemed really ambitious. So uh, it wasn't clear to me how, how that starts. Um, some of them are already started, so the reef it's piloted and it just needs to be scaled. Some of them are utterly simple. A floating wetland uh, is, is pennies really in, in the scheme of things. Uh, the large underutilized parcel, single owner, deadlocked in controversy for 30 years. It's time to use that for, to, to, to solve, you know, uh, for collective action. Uh, so, and, and Pickleweed Park, uh, it's, it's demonstrated uh, its viability and its importance, and it, it's just a place that needs investment. And there's many projects converging there, and they all just need to get together and, and make a, a, a bigger, something bigger happen. Uh, the only uh, last comment I would have is this whole idea of elevation and engaging the community. If that could be, uh, I don't, I wasn't out in the neighborhood, uh, but that is such a powerful, powerful term uh, to, to kind of drive that throughout the, if in fact everything is, you know, kind of changes in elevation, et cetera, I think that would be amazing to uh, continue to drive home. Uh, I too am impressed with the, the vision that you, you have. And, um, I'm, I think most of the strategies, though, are a bit more appropriate to dealing with flooding than with inundation. The wetlands, the, the reefs, those are good for temporary flooding. With long-term inundation with sea level rise, this is a case where true elevation really becomes very important. And San Francisco Bay is a tough place because it's one of the few sediment-starved estuaries in the entire world. So what, how, where, how do you elevate? Uh, loaded question. 
how do you elevate? Um, there are, uh, we've tried to describe many techniques for this awkward uh, in-between period, but ultimately, uh, there is a regional transportation corridor that slices through this place. It's important for so many reasons. Uh, and uh, the city and the transportation agencies need to recognize this moment of transformation and the, and the possibility of acquiring the space and combining the resources that could build something that's multi-generational. Uh, and so uh, the opportunity is right there. And I think, uh, I think we said it in, in, the, in, the, in the presentation, uh, that's a hundred plus year solution, but you gotta start. Hi, uh, I joined my fellow jurors and uh, thank you for your presentation. My name is Sarah Ichioka. Um, I was really intrigued both in reading the report and then hearing the um, presentation from you now um, by this phrase that there's a contradiction between the data and community sentiment. Um, I can see really clearly how there would be support uh, for the Pickleweed Park. Um, transformation that seems absolutely clear that it would have community support but I wondered if you could share with us um, for the other uh, four pilot projects you talked about um, what evidence you have of community support from the various different groups that you talked about having um, sometimes overlapping but distinct sets of interests in the area sure um, I'm gonna take I'll take, so you, you talked about Pickleweed Park. Uh, I'm gonna talk about two of them and I'll let Claire answer uh, the, uh, another one about the new housing. Um, uh, Marin County um, loves its wild places and, uh, and, and certainly under, in, in values uh, the, the, the ecology of the place. And uh, the reef is something that's supported now and, and it really just needs to be supplied with, uh, with resources. All the smarts and energy and, and interest uh, is there. Uh, for the bike lane project, um, there's an enormous paranoia uh, that um, uh, that if if we can't leave here, then we have to go far away. It's not staying next to our existing community. It's we have to move of, of, of somewhere far away, and um, and so uh, and it needs to happen now. Uh, so this continuous alignment uh, was was actually uh, an idea that um, we started discussing with the city engineer in one of our first meetings and and uh, it's something that we grew into uh, a multi-benefit project and it would preserve housing and allow them to buy time and it's really hard to argue uh, that, um, that that there's another viable solution for buying time for that ground um, so uh, then there's then there's the Canal, what's called the Canalway site, and I'll just let Claire talk about um, you know the potential for that. And and too, I'm going to loop you into this. So I think what we all recognize and what people spoke about, whether it was at the flood fair or in meetings, was the affordability crisis that is ultimately a resiliency crisis. But what we recognized, and I think that's why Pickleweed Park's so important, was that the community, interwoven community connections ultimately were a resiliency strategy that many other people could learn from. And there isn't necessarily an investment in civic space, public space joined with elevating the pumps or raising the soccer field or creating additional capacity for a group of people to go when an earthquake hits. So if you twin that with acquisition, a healthy acquisition by city and state of parcels that could then go to policies where renters are getting a kind of, I'll call it a basis for what they put in, and smaller property owners that are facing uh, incredible odds in terms of insurance, you could start to take what are some larger state mechanisms now that are emerging. You know, albeit this is emerging, but the, the strength of the people there is the 8,000 people who have already invested. And, and I think you probably have a more Bay Area perspective on that. That particular community actually is pretty at risk. 
um, there are very few protections for tenants in that area. Um, the properties are generally privately owned, and I think that there's a well-founded concern about whether or not they would be provided for um, in any of the plans moving forward. So I think it really just suggests that there's a really big role for the city, the county, to play in stepping in to ensure that they can protect and they will protect the residents who are living there. I just want to bring this back around. You said, why would they support these other projects? A really simple answer is a lot of them make their living with a car. They don't have anywhere to park, and they come home, and they can't find a place to park, and it adds 15, 20 minutes to their day. So that project is a big parking reservoir that provides flood protection and new places for businesses, and, and that's the really the simple answer. It just it takes a pain point away from their everyday lives and improves their position in life. So that's that's the 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 big underutilized I think what site. describing is that you have a typology that can grow over time, but you can start with even a parking level that can be uh, changed over time. Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, team, uh, for the presentation. Uh, I read the book uh, before. Um, I have a, a different question. Um, something you didn't present, not in the book, but also not in uh, today, so I was curious about. If you read it, fast forward, uh, everything changed. Nothing stays the same, because everything is vulnerable. The environment, the housing, the people, the infrastructure, the businesses, the economy. But I, I don't hear you say, this, this means like within the next 50 years, not one part of San Rafael is the same. That's, that's pretty big. Can you help us a little in how that works, also in the story? Because uh, you can look at it from a business case and think, ah, oh, let's get the hell out of here. Or look at it from an environmental or social. It's, it's, you're so modest in the presentation that, but if you do everything you say, San Rafael is like wiped from the map and then rebuilt again. Uh, so the question is, uh, how does that resonate with you, with the politicians, with the citizens, with the investors? But also, how does that work? Uh, uh, let's split this one. So um, everything you see there was made in 50 years, even less. All, all of that, Dyke Bayland, filled with dredge spoils, made in 50 years. The, the quality of the construction uh, uh, is not built to last. So it inherently is going to be remade. And we're trying to answer the question, if you're going to remake it, how would you do it? That's number one. Uh, number two is uh, a single event. So that's one answer. Yeah. But that is then something I would, because yeah, that's not what I read. Huh? So it's interesting. This answer is yeah, like, you have to do it anyway, you better do it right. But you present it from a different perspective, which is, int so I'm, I'm just trying to figure out how this works. Huh? Yeah. Um, so that's, that's one way how it works. Uh, another way how it works is uh, right now, a single event uh, could take out basically the majority of the housing stock, right? So action is needed. Uh, so it's not a sit and wait. It's a, uh, it's a, you know, a plan your steps uh, because this needs to, this needs to, the project needs to kind of get underway. Uh, I, I think that's just the simplest, most straightforward answer to your question. Um, you don't have to, you don't have to, this change, and then the last part is, these parcels are changing over this terrain, like in this short space of time. It's there right now to do. It's th it's there right now to act upon. Hi, <clears throat> hi, uh, congratulations. Can you hear me? Uh, for your presentation, my name is Roberto Morris. Um, I would like to know how you can. Tell us more about your the connections between your Catholic projects for with your strategy for earthquakes, please. Can, can you 
Could you repeat the earthquakes. question? How are we preparing for earthquakes? Yeah. Uh, Claire, why don't you? Um, so I, I want to twin that to the answer that uh, Marcel mm -hmm. just gave to Hank's question, which is basically the strongest uh, impetus. Uh, imagine that things that get built uh, in California, except for the very tall towers, get built very quickly. They, they, it's very young. And also things change and people are, have a huge amount of work to adapt the current buildings. In many cases, things aren't adaptable in terms of earthquakes. And in particular, streets and infrastructure are not particularly adaptable. So the opportunity here is to raise certain streets, raise certain pumps, provide different kinds of housing platforms and other housing so that you start moving reasonably quickly into a new basis for codes and construction. At the same time, there's, uh, there is the incremental that happens all over the place. So we recognize that every Catalyst project, in a way, had needed the seed of the Pickleweed Park project, which it needs public space, community space, space to go for mass evacuation, for bathrooms, for food, and that that actually should be embedded, no matter what, in every catalytic project. I, I can uh, follow back to, to this. I think I, think I applaud the uh, beginning with the local place, with the park, with the, what people can do about their existing situation, building on the community that's there and things they see to do now. Um, that's necessary. Um, but in the larger perspective, looking to 100 percent change or whatever the percentage change would be, um, the region changed too. And so this, the static condition of all the, of all the transport through it and around it and all that, and then we're gonna rebuild this similar to what it was with whatever polar changes that are within it. Without, it's, it's difficult to, it's easy to go from the beginning, the start point, and it's possible to conceive another world, although it's very difficult because the first 50 years, we know how hard it is for people to change once they've done it, to give up on what they have. But if that situation of change is occurring, what's the regional change? And how does that impact what you need to do here? And is that something that you thought to factor? Do you understand? Yes. Uh, the, the regional change, uh, I, I think, is best described uh, if you look at a map. You have San Francisco, you have Oakland, you have Richmond. They're all recognized as logistical centers for the Bay Area that make it work. And San Rafael's the other corner of that box. And it's not. It's thought of as small town sleepy Marin. Uh, and it just, that has to shift. Uh, everything flows through that place. And uh, the region needs to value San Rafael and its infrastructure. Uh, as it does San Francisco in its seawall, or, uh, uh, or Richmond in its deep water port, uh, or Oakland. So, yeah. This ties to my... That's the bell. <laughs> <laughs> do it. Come on, Hank, do it. Yeah, can I? Yeah? Okay. Uh, it, you know, be careful. Huh? Ties to the question, because everything's at risk, everyone's at risk, everything needs to change, Everyone needs to change. So there is a, a story to that. There, there is a future for San Rafael. That's what you offer them. But it, it feels like by be, go, becoming so pragmatic, and yes, we can do this, uh, one by one by one, that that narrative, that perspective is missing. So, and I think that ties into what the region will become in the next 100 years. Where is San Rafael in that region? And what is that type of narrative people can attached to too, because otherwise it's a rebuild against something that might happen instead of you know, reinvent ourselves. Uh, and I think you're reinventing San Rafael without you know, producing that narrative. This could be construed into a plan of retreat. And I would simply say, um, it, 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 it could be, it could be. Uh, and I would just simply say that this is a plan of attack. And, 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 and that's, that's really what's called for. Yeah, so okay, that's make that it. We'll yeah. uh, wrap it up. Perfect, thank you.
Thanks so much. I'm going to announce the next 